Hey guys, Darkovica here, and welcome to the very first. Is it running that slow? No, I hope not. Uh, welcome to the very first book club video. So, as a you know, as a reminder, uh, we started this last week, and it is currently. I'm out. I'm a little out of breath. It's currently January 31st, 2021. Just for the people who come to this later, you can still join in. Um, you know, just follow along with the videos. And I will mark down whenever I start to talk about a new chapter. The idea is literally just every time I finished a chapter, I picked up my phone and started recording uh, my thoughts on the chapter. The videos get a little longer the further into the chapters I go. So, you know, that works out. Uh, in the very beginning, they're quite short, but that's just because, you know, it's the very beginning. Um, so yeah, so the, the basic principle is just we pick a book. Uh, every Tuesday I'm going to upload a video talking about what I read and then we can have a discussion in the co in the uh, comments below. If you're not reading along, you can still tune in just to sort of see what we're talking about and, you know, see what everybody thinks about the book. And maybe, you know, after hearing about a couple of the chapters, you might decide that you do want to read the book. Um, now... <clears throat> Very quickly, there were a couple of issues that I noticed. I don't know if this is going to come through on YouTube. I have tried everything I can think of. For some reason, my phone did something really, really weird to the audio, and I don't know what. Depending on how this video uh, comes out, I want to see what it turns out like on YouTube. Um, I may have to find a different way to record these. If it comes out just fine, then everything's great. I don't have to worry. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, it's basically, just to make a long story short, it separated, oh, don't, don't mind this shirt, this is just an old shirt, I'm not announcing another pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> it is basically, it's, the audio is uneven in both ears, and if I make it mono, it completely tunes out one ear, and if I make it mono, duplicate, and try to copy it over to the other ear, for some reason, the two waveforms aren't the same, so it doesn't match up, so I can't even match the volume, because even if I raise one to match the other, the waveforms are different. It's just, it's really odd. I don't know how to explain it. Um, yeah, you agree? <laughs> anyway, so that's just that. Uh, here we go. Welcome to our first book club for Hood. So, again, I'm going to be a little quiet because uh, my son is sleeping. I basically do everything when my son is sleeping. So I just finished the prologue for Hood, which was not very long. Um, it's about five pages long or so. And um, I did make a few notes, you know, as, as you do. And um, one of the things that I kind of giggled about was like on page two, um, Bran is thinking to himself something that I guess his friend or some other kid, a long-legged kid named Iwan? 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 It's probably Iwan, I bet. Um, it says, do not aim the arrow. The older youth had instructed him, just think it to the mark. Send it on your thought, and if your thought is true, so too will fly the arrow. I sure do wish archery had been that simple for me. <laughs> I had warped arrows. I could have thought my way to victory with those arrows, but they weren't going to go anywhere. <laughs> um, another thing that I really liked... Ah, my clock. Thank you. Uh, another part that I liked was... Oh, I had to look up the word pairing because I'd never seen it used in that in that way. On page four, it said, uh, Ewan, or Iwan's long legs pairing the distance with each stride. And it means reduce something in size, extent, quantity, or number, usually in a number of small successive stages. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> that was that. And then at one point, Iwin says, weeping Judas, which is kind of a really funny, uh, it's kind of like an expletive or just a term of like exasperation, which is really funny to me. Weeping Judas. Weeping Judas. <laughs> Sounds really nice. I don't know why I liked that so much. And on page five, um... There's a part where Iwin and Bran show up and like a page before Iwin was all like, oh, just leave the stupid pig because obviously Bran just killed a pig. And Bran is like, no, it's for my mother who is sick. And Iwin, and then like in the next page, Iwin is all like, uh, he was hunting and a hunter cannot leave his 
prize or something like that. And all the other hunters accept this. And I'm like, just a minute ago, you were all hopped up on leaving the pig behind. Now you're glad you didn't. Um, and then so I finished the prologue. That was it. And uh, my thoughts were basically like, it's it's really interesting to see Bran losing interest in the hunt and wondering how that's going to affect him, considering he's meant to be Robin Hood. So, I mean, I think so anyway. Um, and Robin's whole thing is, you know, obviously hunting deer and boar in Sherwood. So it'll be really interesting to see how losing interest in the hunt is going to play out in the future. I wonder if he'll be very bitter about it. Um, so yeah. Oh, I, I definitely had a lot of feels at the, at the end of the, for such a very short prologue, I had chills reading that bit at the very end with his mother, because you could tell that's where it was going, but not in a bad way, especially because it was so short. So it was just, it just perfectly led into it. And it, uh, for considering I hardly know any of these characters and it's only been five pages, I felt, I felt feelings for Bran's mother dying despite the fact that he caught her this prize boar. So yeah, that's the prologue. I just finished chapter one. Um, chapter one was pretty cool. It was a lot of intense stuff. Uh, right off the bat, I like when, when, you know, four riders appear on a road and one of them leaves and three of them refuse to move for a war band of like 30 people. I don't know. I feel like I would have been like, mm, something's going on here. There's no way. There's no way. These guys, <laughs> there's no way three riders would be like, yeah, we could stop. We, we could stop these guys. Right. But then again, you know, the proud um, so that was obviously when he rounded the corner, there was a, an ambush waiting for him. I was like, huh, didn't see that coming. <laughs> uh, it is kind of sad to think that all this is happening. And meanwhile, Bran is back, you know, home, um, apparently sleeping with someone and, but he has no idea that none of this is going on. So that's really interesting. But um, yeah, so that's, I mean, you know, a lot, again, a lot happened. And we know that Iwen is apparently the king's champion. So he must be much older than Bran. I, I figure at least a few years older than Bran. But I guess he's going to escape from the warband and try to make it back to um, the town or the, the fort or castle, I forget, and try to warn them. I did look up like 18 billion things. Um... <laughs> So the word Simri that I was definitely mispronouncing, I think is Cumbri, Cumbri, Cum, Cumbri, something like that. And C-A-D-W is Cadu, C-O-E-D is Coid, I think. And W-Y-E, I think is Y. So there, I looked things up. I still don't know how to pronounce Brick and so I think one thing said Bree. Oh yeah, that's right. I tried looking that up. I tried looking up the pronunciation of Brickin, B R Y C H A N, and I found eighteen different things, and all of them said something different. <laughs> there was like Bree Chan. There was Brykin. There was Breekin. There was uh Bree Brichan. Brichin. There was like eighteen different things. I was like, all right, well, I'm just gonna say Brickin because I don't know, nothing agrees. So I can't agree with a, a thing that doesn't agree. That was just Google, obviously. So there you go. <laughs> I tried, but yeah. So I think that was basically all of my thoughts on chapter one. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, these are gonna be fairly short, pretty early on. As more stuff happens, these will probably get a lot longer because we'll have things to think about and be like, oh, what's what's gonna happen right now it's just well you know Bran's dad was just killed 35 members of a war band were brutally murdered probably by an army of 300 and Bran is sleeping with a woman did Iwin make it who knows probably I hope so I'm already attached even though I barely know these people okay I have finished chapter two and this one was a lot more intense than chapter one in a way. So chapter two, obviously we see how Bran is and he's very much the spoiled rich kid, which actually you kind of, like I'm excited in a way to see him turn from this spoiled rich kid into what will hopefully be the hero Robin Hood. Um, but obviously 
there's a way that Marion describes, oh, and of course Marion was introduced in this chapter, which, you know, excellent. I love Marion. And um, the way that she describes Bran is like, God, I knew someone like him when I was in college and he was such a jerk. Like I want to use some different words here, but I don't think that YouTube will be very happy if I use them. He was the most cocky son of a biscuit I've ever known in my life and I hated it. And like we were friends to start, but by the time, like like a month later, I loathed him and he was so pushy and he was just like the type of person who thinks that he's owed things, you know, things. And he was just like, I found out later that he made bets that he would eventually win me over. I don't know. It was stupid. And I, bleh. and uh, Bran is kind of described in the same way. So I was already just like, oh, good. You know, I kind of can't wait for Bran to get this smack of reality that will shatter his entire world and shatter this stupid, cocky son of a biscuit. Because, God, it reminded me so much of this dude. He was like, he's the type of guy who was like, I have lunch with the mayor on the weekends and I'm like, okay, and what am I supposed to do with that? Do you, let me play Final Fantasy IX, all right? I'm not interested in your dang mayor, all right? What am I gonna do with that? Um, I've, I've still got some salt, clearly, all these years later. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of fun. And then the way that the chapter, and I liked this chapter because they give obviously this lighthearted feel to Bran's life and this town before this war band or before this army is going to show up and just destroy everything. So this is like life right before disaster is about to hit. And it's such an interesting like piece. Like, you know, you know, as the reader, this piece is about to be shattered, right? All of this is about to be shattered. And you're just, you're holding your breath every minute waiting for Iwan or Ewan to show up. And he does at the very end of the chapter. So Exciting to see how he's going to break the news to Bran on what's happened. I'm recording this next to a very happy baby, so uh, there might be some very high-pitched noises. <laughs> <laughs> but I've just finished chapter, I think, three? I just did? Yep. Chapter three. And um, very uh, interesting. We've had a new character introduced, a new party also interested in the lands of El Fayo and all of Wales. I almost said Welsh. That's not a country. Wales is the country. Um, so yeah, we have a new party involved, which shall be very interesting to say the least. <laughs> and um, we have a very crafty wife who, the description of her is very interesting. I actually kind of like it. A woman who wishes who doesn't want to dress in warm clothes, which is very interesting. And she's so determined that even as she falls sick over and over and over again, she like doesn't do anything about it, which makes me wonder if she's doing that to avoid her husband for whatever reason. So I'm interested to see more of uh, Lady Agnes from this chapter, because I'm sure she's got some interesting backstory and some interesting reasons for wanting to be sick all the time <laughs> because she refuses to dress warmly in cold weather. Yeah, yeah, you taking part, you taking part. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my thoughts on uh, chapter three, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I've just finished chapter four. Again, you may hear the excited exultations of a very happy baby in the background. Um, chapter four is super nerve-wracking. Bran has saved Iwin barely. Iwin? Ewan? I'm gonna say Iwin. Uh, and he's just warned all of the monks that the Franck are coming. The Franck. I think it's Franck. And um, they're insisting that he go to Undane the way that his father was supposed to go and try to make peace with, uh, with King William, I think it's supposed to be. And I remember specifically from chapter when Brickin was being attacked by um, the Browse, they said that William wouldn't see Brickin. And, you know, Bran is having serious misgivings about this, and I think Bran is correct. I don't think King William is going to see them because I'm pretty sure King William gave away Elphael to de Browse. So 
seeing the king in Lundane is not going to help anyone, and he definitely needs to go and try and save the things that he can save the way that he wants to, because I'm pretty sure that either this is a trap, it is a setup, or it's going to end in tears, which is very, very likely. I had a hair wrapped around my foot. So, yeah, that's going to go well, I'm sure. I have just finished chapter five. Chapter five. Chapter five. And um, the one thing that prevailed in my mind was that Bran is sending everything to the monastery. Now, a popular, or not popular, I guess, but a common trope or theme in Robin Hood is that typically they also target the churches because a lot of the priests in the stories of Robin Hood are usually corrupt and are often as rich and wealthy as the king is, you know, or Prince John, because they take money from the people and instead of using that money to help the people as they're supposed to, they keep the money and spend it on themselves. So we've already kind of had a taste of like distaste for the Bishop Asaf? Afris. Oop, I forgot his name. It was very short. We're gonna probably see him again, but I have a, there was kind of like a distaste already for him. So I feel like, I've got some stuff on my face. I feel like um, Bran is going to have to go toe to toe with the monastery that he was talking about in. Nope, I forgot the name of the town too. It started with two L's. Um, but basically, they're sending everything there. They're sending all of the money from Care um, Care Cadwin. Wow, I've just my brain. I've, I've literally forgotten everything, but Iwin, Bran, and. Froll, the monk. Um, yeah, so they're sending everything to this monastery, including all the money, and I just have a very bad feeling that this monastery is not going to give it back, or they're going to give up Bran and be like, oh, yes, the Frank, our new, our new besties. You know, we're, we're all friends here, you know, and Bran's going to get betrayed, basically. So that, that's, my, that's my feel. We'll see if that's true. I just finished uh, chapter six. Yeah. <laughs> I just finished chapter six. And um, I'm very, very anxious. But also, I think chapter six so far has given me the most feelings of Robin Hood, which is very interesting. So Bran is at a stage where he's very flawed. Now, he is the heir to the throne. He's a prince, a literal prince. Um, in this case, who is obviously heir to the throne now that his father Brickin has died, he, he will become king. Assuming all goes to plan and their trip to Lundane actually gets them their lands back. Doubtful. Um, but it gives me such Robin, such strong Robin feels because like Bran right now is, is very, very childish. He doesn't want to take the throne and yet he still shows signs of being a good king for his people. He talks poorly about his father, and Iwin does as well, mentioning that he believes uh, Bran, I almost said Robin, he believes Bran will have the ability to be a better king than his father was. Um, now, Bran, of course, doesn't want to be king, but you see through the way that he thinks and, and the things that are happening, you see the beginnings of the story of Robin Hood, and you see the beginnings of Bran being this this character who will be able to take care of people who desperately need it and even the scene where you know the children the two little girls in the marketplace have their eggs and they're kicked away from them by the franc Rob or Bran coming to their rescue and giving them money out of his own purse that's a very Robin thing to do and it's it's so exciting to see it because he talks about not wanting to be a king and he thinks to himself about wanting to be selfish and wishing he could have run away and left you know, his home behind and all of its troubles and becoming king, all of that, you know, leave it behind. And then he goes and does things and says things like wanting justice for the people who can't get it for themselves, which is a very kingly thing to do, as I think it was Froll who mentioned that being king is all about, you know, protecting people, which is very true. Was, oh no, baby, hi. It was warped by the kings themselves, you know, the kings of the past. But initially, the idea of, like, a lord or a king or a baron or, you know, what have you 
was to protect the people of the land, was to protect, you know, the peasants and the people working the land, and it was to provide, you know, protection as the Roman Empire fell apart. And so, you know, Bran clearly shows the signs of someone who does care about his people and wants to protect them, and, you know, his, but his experience of a king is that he thinks if he becomes king, he must be like his father and go to war and be proud and cruel and not care about his people so much as care about like his liege lords and all that stuff. So obviously Bran's got a negative out, out view of, of nobility and all that fun stuff, which fair. Um, but it's also, it's just very interesting to see, like there was the one bit where Bran was freaking out over the pile of the dead, you know, his, his lost friends and, and, you know, he was uh, upset for very, you know, vi valid reasons, almost said vital, for very valid reasons, clearly, and holding his loved ones and, and, and begging them to open their eyes and come back and remembering what they had done for him. And when they knelt and began praying over the bodies, it kind of, I don't know why, but I got such a feeling of, yes, this is Robin Hood. This is the strife. This is, it's going to happen, you know, and like the, the discussion of God and, you know, them talking about, and, you know, not knowing why things happen. It's, you know, it's so interesting to see that, yes, there was this, this great loss and this great tragedy, but it will obviously give birth to a man who's going to save his people and save other people and bring justice to those who desperately need it. So that was kind of really, really cool to see and, and see that hinted at and, and feel it in the air, so to speak. So just had a lot of sad, but very excited feelings for this. And also, I'm going to call it, I think we're about to see Tuck. I'm just saying, at the end of this, we're knocking on the doorbell of, of a priest or, yeah, someone who lives in this barn that is unmarked. Um, and and Froll is very excited. I'm, I'm say, I'm going to say it. I'm, I think it's Tuck. I'm going to say it. I think we're about to meet Tuck. Okay. So it's come to my attention over the last couple of videos that... Uh, my audio is kind of funky. I don't know why, but uh, alas, for the time being, I have to keep recording with my phone. So if the audio is really weird in this video, I'm so sorry. I'll try to figure out what's causing it, but it's really bizarre. Anyways, I just finished chapter seven, which was an extremely exciting chapter in terms of Robin Hood lore. Um, I was correct. It's Friar Tuck that we've just met, uh, as I'm sure all of you have noticed from finishing chapter seven. <laughs> Well, at least those of you who are reading it. And uh, this was kind of a fun chapter because I didn't even realize that Iwin or, or Ewan or I don't know how it would be pronounced, I-W-A-N in Cymru. Sure, I think that's how it's said. I'm probably saying that with a horrible accent. But um, apparently the English name is John. So not only have we had Friar Tuck, but now we have Little John. And I'm also really, really pleased with the way that Lawhead is depicting Tuck, because it is exactly the way that Tuck was always kind of depicted, which was, he's a, he's a Christian or Catholic priest, or friar even, but he was meant to kind of reflect like a more human version of the church. So Robin's enemies are not always just the nobility. Half the time his enemies, at least in in many legends, I wouldn't say all, but you know, most of the legends, he, he is an enemy of more or less the church at some point, but not the religion, so to speak. He's not a he's not an enemy of God. He's an enemy of the church because in most of his stories the church has become corrupt and the priests are also stealing from the poor and using the money to fatten their coffers and, and, uh, and, you know, just kind of be wealthy when they're not supposed to be wealthy. They're priests. The money is supposed to go to the people, but they're, you know, not flawed, but, um, corrupt. So Tuck was supposed to represent the other side of the coin, the human side where he errs ever so slightly because, you know, he's supposed to be not just a priest, but a friar, which are supposed to be, um, they live off of nothing. They, they eat very little. Um, in some stories he has like the things that he's not supposed to have, which is like ale and mead and, and very good food. He hides it in his cupboards because he doesn't, he likes, he likes to eat the things, uh, the nice things, the good things he's not supposed to eat as a friar, but he still eats them. And he's, and yet he's still more 
holy than the corrupt priests and those things. And he's actually quite strong in a lot of stories too. He's able to best Robin. Actually, all of his best people are typically able to beat up Robin, which I always kind of enjoyed because, you know, you get a lot of stories where the hero is stronger than everybody and able to beat everybody. And not with Robin, actually. Robin's best friends are usually people who beat the snot out of him, including Marion a couple times when she's in, you know, when she's not, um, when she's in, um, disguise. There we go. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what am I thinking of? But yeah, pretty much everyone, all of his closest people are able to beat him in everything except archery, which is fine because archery is his thing. And that's the one thing that he's really good at. But Little John, Friar Tuck, um, Will Scarlet in some stories, um, Marion, they've all had a story where each and every one of them has like beat him up and won. And, um, and he's just like, oh my god, you're amazing. Join my people. So I like the way that Friar Tuck was um, depicted as this jolly friar who's not, you know, holier than thou. He's also quite strong, quite nimble, very good with a staff and, you know, just meant, to, sorry, I have a notification. It bothers me when that happens. Um, just meant to represent like a more human friar, a more human side to the church, which I always really, really enjoyed and really liked. So yeah, chapter seven had a lot of feelings. <laughs> Well, chapter eight was brutal. <laughs> there was a lot that happened in chapter eight, some of which made me laugh very much, some of which was very interesting, and some of which was just absolutely brutal. Um, first of all, on on page 77, there was a quote that I liked, which was, oh, I just lost it. Hang on. So it was on page 77, it was uh, Bran thinking to himself, and it said, Ordinarily, he would not have endured such a misery in silence, but the sight of the city brought the reason for their sojourn fresh to mind, and his soul sank beneath the weight of an infinitely greater grief. Something about that sentence was just really pretty. It was just a, a very a very neat sentence, I guess, but uh, it was also very powerful because it, despite the fact that it's very, um, I don't want to say prosy, but very like you know, like, some people complain about writing that's written too flowery. That's what I'm looking for. Um, it's almost at that level, and yet at the same time, it still evokes a lot of feeling. So it's a, just a very well-written sentence, I think. And then on page 86, another sentence that I liked for a completely different reason. Friar Ethelfrith stifled a hoot of contempt for the man's insinuation. Instead, he beamed beatifically and loosed a soft fart. What a Robin Hood thing to do. I mean, that's Friar Tuck, but like, just, just absolute beauty. Just perfection. Um, and then, of course, with the chapter ending with Bran in a, like, white-hot rage, just envisioning setting the entire table and all of the clerks aflame was just in intense. Like, it took, it was like, it reminded me of, okay, this is gonna be a terrible comparison. Don't hate me. But like, I remember, I still remember when I went to go see the last Twilight movie. Again, don't hate me. But there's, um, you know, it's a slight spoiler, but there's a thing at the very end of the film where they, they cut away from the book entirely and they have this massive battle that doesn't happen in the book. And it was so sudden and so unexpected that everyone in the theater started screaming in confusion and everyone was freaking out. We were all gripping each other like, this doesn't happen. And then it turns out that it was all a vision. And um, it was the same kind of thing here. I was like, please be a vision. Please be a vision. Because I was like, oh my god, he's going to set ablaze this entire room and burn people alive. But it was, it was a vision, thankfully. And then, oh, the other thing I was thinking of was when Tuck pulls Bran away, or Ethelfrith, I should say, which is a very fun thing to say, assuming I'm saying it correctly. But uh, when Ethelfrith pulls Bran away from almost sleeping with the alewife, I have a feeling that that was a potentially dangerous situation and that Bran is just simply not aware of what type of place that was, which Tuck only slightly hints at. Um, I don't, I mean, like, Tuck says something along the lines of, like, it being a den of iniquity kind of thing, but I think that it was probably an actually quite dangerous location. And there was a pretty good chance that if Bran had actually slept with her, he was probably going to get mugged or even killed. So maybe for the best that he didn't. Um, 
So now we have the plot laid out for us. Bran needs 600 silver in order to buy back his lands. And who even knows how long that's going to hang about because, you know, that's an intense thing to request. Um, also brings to mind how very, like, how very just... How much like the the court system and the law re just relied on people's word of mouth, right? Like you walked in, and they they walked in, and Iwan was just like, "I was there. I was injured. Everybody was killed." And they were, uh, you know, these clerks were like, "Oh, geez, wow, yeah, that's pretty sucky," and that's it. That's the proof was just Iwan, you know, or you know, little John. But um, it's just it's uh, so you know we have our thing laid out instead of it being that Robin needs to bring together the funds to save King Richard, I think he's what we're aiming for here is that he needs to bring together the funds. Oh no, to save, excuse me, to save his lands. So we'll see if that holds because if he becomes Robin, that's going to oh maybe they take English names in order to hide their identities, right? Because I, I was thinking if he becomes an outlaw, then I don't think that that addendum to the to the sale of the land is going to hold up. If, if he becomes an outlaw, I'm pretty sure he's not going to be able to get his lands back. But maybe they will ditch their, you know, their Welsh names and he's going to become Robin and Iwan is going to become John and Ethelfrith is going to become Tuck. <sighs> And I don't know who Froll is, uh, or even if Froll is going to stay alive. I have a very bad feeling that Brother Fro Froll is going to die. I don't want him to. I genuinely like him, you know, for, he's like, he's like the middle of the coin. Like, Tuck is one side of the coin. The, the clerk that they just talked to with the red hair and the cross with the rubies on it, that's the other side of the coin. What priest needs a cross with rubies set into it? You know? Um, but I think Froll is somewhere in the middle. He's a very holy man. He, you know, says all the right things, beautiful things, believes fully in his religion, but also he's not the side of the coin where he wears rubies on a cross around his neck. So I just have a bad feeling that Froll is going to die because he's too nice. He's too nice. He's too good a person. We all like him. He's not going to stick around. All right. You know, good people like that. They never stick around in stories. So I'm just calling it now. But uh, yeah, so chapter nine. Well, chapter nine sucked. <laughs> um, first of all, wow, I called that a literally a chapter in advance. Brother Froll is dead. I should have, ah, wow, I, that sucked. I knew he was going to die. He was literally too good for this world. And we all know what happens to characters who are too good for this world in books. They die. Apparently a chapter after I call it. Um, I will say a completely different tone, but the very beginning of chapter nine. And a pleasant journey home, minced Ethel Frith in a rude parody of Cardinal Ranulf. Bring me my staff and I will give that bloated toad a pleasant journey hence. Loved it. Just very, very Friar Tuck, but uh, obviously the mood has been ruined since then. I am assuming because Ethelfreth wasn't really mentioned after that that he stayed. I don't know if I accidentally just zoned out for a phrase that said that he stayed behind. I'm assuming he didn't come to Cymru with them. Or to Wales. Cymru. Cymru? Cymru? I'm so sorry. Um... But yeah, so I I don't believe Tuck has come with them. And of course now Bran has been captured. Why he wasn't killed when Froll was an unarmed priest seems like a really dumb thing to do. Um, kill a priest. But, you know, then again, this is an extremely, uh, you know, the, the whole point of Robin Hood is that he is a, a man of justice against the corrupted. So I have a bad feeling that we're going to see that not much... Um, not much justice is brought in the name of, of Froll. I'm assuming that Iwin survives, considering he's supposed to be Little John. I'm going to be very upset if he doesn't. Um, yeah, just a lot happened in a very few amount of pages, and it sucked. Oh, also, there was another sentence that I really liked, which was, When heaven joined battle against you, who could stand? That was a really cool sentence. Just very, very nicely worded. Again, just very, very good writing. 
Oh, and also, answer that, replied the monk sagely, and you answer the riddle of the ages. Throughout the long history of our race, no tribe or nation has ever been able to simply leave us alone. Very powerful statement. In, in a lot of ways, a good reference to just a lot of cultures around the world, not even just the Welsh, but also the Irish, you know, uh, many of many small settlements uh, that were taken by the English or the British or, you know, my history is failing me here, just uh, invaders. Because in every culture, right, people get claimed by someone else and they just become part of that culture, but they weren't always part of that culture. And it's, you know, that is the riddle of the ages. No one has ever been able to be left alone. But even if you were to leave someone alone, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to leave you alone. You know what I mean? So it's just a very brutal time in history where no one is left alone. So just just some powerful stuff. Poor Froll. He died so... Again, just too good for this world. Just too good for this world. <laughs> But yeah, so there we go. Chapter nine. Um, I'm stopping there for today. This doesn't mean anything for the video. I don't know why I'm telling you this. Uh, so I will look different and be different. You can hear my child. I don't think he's crying. I think he's just exploring his vocal cords, his vocal range. Probably. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> or I'll be, I'm not seeing you anywhere. I'm going to be back. Bye. What? All right, this is the end of the video. I just wanted to kind of do a formal goodbye instead of ending it with the last chapter. Um, so I didn't get to exactly where I wanted to get to by this week, but I mean, to be fair, <laughs> I've got some things that I'm doing in between reading stuff. Um, but I am really happy with what I read and I really, really, really like the book. The book is really nice, especially as I was reading, uh, Mists of Avalon recently. Mists of Avalon is really good, but also really, really, really heavy. And Hood isn't quite that heavy. And I'm not a huge fan of, like, hyper-realistic books that, like, they, they show hyper-realism by making everything very grungy and depressed sometimes. And I'm not a huge fan of that. It's almost grimdark. It's, Miss, Miss of Avalon is not grimdark. And I definitely don't like grimdark at all. But it's like, it's like a stepping stone to grimdark. So, I typically don't like books that are just a little too depressing. I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, and Hood, thankfully, doesn't appear to have that. So uh, I'm really into it, and I hope you guys are too. And I, I'm very excited to see what you guys think in the comments below and what you think of the series and how, how I'm obviously structuring this. Like I said, it's not very professionally structured, and God only knows what the audio sounds like. So thank you very, very much, guys, and uh, talk to you later.